Hi, this is your Sapna Bhartia and welcome to your Farless Talk. Today we have with us David Eads, Senior Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat. David, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, good to be here. It's my pleasure to host you here. And it's also really important because we are discussing 10 years of Kubernetes. Uh, in the beginning, I mean, when we looked at Kubernetes, when it emerged, like any other emerging technologies, there were a lot of doubts, whether it was the early days of Docker or even the Linux kernel. And Linux kernel has been around for, what, 30, 40 years now? And think about these technologies. There is still, it's, it's wrong to say that they're still powering the world. Actually, they are running the world, technology like Linux. So when we look at Kubernetes, it is a technology, and not just technology, the whole culture, the whole ecosystem that is built around it is massive. So what I want to know from you is that when Kubernetes was being announced, when CNCF was created with Kubernetes as the anchor project, where were you, what were you doing, and what were your thoughts when you heard about Kubernetes? <laughs> uh well, I mean, to be honest, I entered that world, gosh, 10 years ago, it was just containers. Like, what is a container? How am I going to use it? What's it good for? Um, and and starting out back then, trying to figure out where we needed to go. What is the right level of abstraction to build? We, we knew the world was ready, right? We needed a way to be able to deploy and manage and organize distributed applications, right? But it wasn't obvious at the time, how would you go about doing that, right? And and there were a lot of different competing views on how that was going to work, right? Uh, different vendors were trying it differently. You can think back, uh, there was the, the IBM offering, I can't remember the name of it, uh, and then there was Docker, and then Kubernetes was trying to come up and say, let's do a level above what that is, but still below some fully assisted piece. Maybe people can learn to love YAML too. Uh, and, and as we were building it, like you were saying, there's, there's a lot of competition in the space and there were discussions about what are we going to be when we grow up? Um, and I don't know that any of us accurately predicted where it was going to land. And now, as you said, you know, none of us knew, and it is true with, I mean, Linus, you know, when I talked to him, even he did not know that Linux will become such, you know, uh, widespread technology uh, when I talked to, you know, folks like, you know, Red Cohort, when they're like, yeah, we, we won, we dominate the world. So if you look at 10 years ago, when you're like, we don't know where this thing will head, and look at 2024 now. So do you think it worked for Kubernetes? Yeah, uh, I do. But actually, the same question keeps coming up. What, what are we going to be when we grow up? What is our actual value? Right, like you, you look and say like, oh sure, like the basic value is the ability to deploy, manage, and organize distributed applications. Uh, you made it possible to to let an application developer say these are the things that I need, and then a different sort of uh, IT manager is able to satisfy that on a cluster, and it makes it portable and movable. And yep, clear win. But you could just as easily say the real value add is the extensions that are built to leverage a revertible GitOps model for application management and evolution, right? Like you, you could just as easily say that. It would be equally true. Um, or, you know, you look back and you say like, just abstraction wise, is the value that we provided the concept of a controller plus an efficient resource watch API model uh, that handles efficiency and SKU uh, so that you're able to build a wider ecosystem. Is that the value? Some people think it is, and you can see them investing in that area. Um, you know, you can go on and on. It is the value, the ability to provide advanced network and security transparently to workloads uh, so that you can have something managed in a way that the application developer doesn't need to worry about it, but they are secure by default. Uh, or is the value going to be something that we do to make it easy to train and serve AI models? Right, everyone is saying this is the value they're bringing it, and they're bringing their projects in. What role has Kubernetes played in making organizations more comfortable with open source? Of course, Linux paid the path. Company like Red Hat, Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, they you know commercialized Linux and open source. Uh, they made organizations comfortable with Linux and open source. 
also because the kind of commercial support that you folks on the Red Hat provide, it also means that you really don't have to have all the tech resources, tech talent to understand those technologies. You can just use as a consumer. You can get the freedom, the flexibility of open source with a commercial support. Uh, how Kubernetes furthered that journey? I think it's been really interesting. Uh, so, you know, you think about Linux, uh, there were a few different distributors of Linux. Obviously, I'm partial to the Red Hat flavor. Um, but, you know, everyone's was significantly different enough that you had to learn how to adopt it differently. It's, it's, it's sticky, a little difficult to move. If you, if you run Ubuntu and you learn how to use App Armor, well, if you're going to again switch and uh, take another learning curve when you run RHEL uh, and, and you end up having to learn um, something like SE Linux, right? Um, Kubernetes has been shockingly standard uh, in terms of its distribution across basically all the vendors, right? That that core API model um, and the expectation that if I distribute my application like this, it will be fairly portable across all these different vendors. I think it really highlights the value that open source brings in a way that you know, there's been other standardization, but it's it's really unique here um, and shockingly useful, right? By keeping that core the same, by actually having a fairly standard authorization model, it's, it's I won't say it's, it goes as far as easy, but it is straightforward to actually be able to build extensions, have them run across multiple different vendors. Uh, and, and so that brings greater ecosystem in and that makes it more valuable to the end user uh, who's installing and running it in their data center or in the cloud or on the edge, wherever they're using it. How you have seen Kubernetes have evolved over the year, or you feel that it has remained true to its core roots, it's just that you no know, people are using it in different use cases. So we spent a bunch of time making that, that core stateless app use case work first, and it worked really, really well. But when you look at where people have taken the extensions to our small core, like we actually have a shockingly small core still, um, but you look at areas where people are trying to make batch workloads run efficiently. Uh, those batch workloads, they're managed completely differently. They run in a different sort of a model. They have different, uh, different needs and they're doing that effectively. So I see us, I see us rising to meet the need, uh, in many different spaces, stateful applications, with persistent volumes. So you can see the evolution of these persistent volumes. How do I get them to run in my data center? How do I get that integration to work? And we've provided a way, fairly small and core, but broad in terms of ecosystem adoption, uh, to be able to satisfy those use cases uh, and, and continue to evolve to where we need to be. It's why people, I think it's why people see so many different value propositions from Cube over the last 10 years. Uh, so the state, stateless application is just one. How you have seen the ecosystem where companies like Red Hat have emerged so that the fact is that this complexity is not going to go away. We have to learn to deal with it. But instead of letting customers deal with it, you deal with it so they can continue to reap the benefit of this flexibility and power of Kubernetes without getting worried about the complexity. Yeah, it's a really big deal. Uh, so even though you have a tremendous number of extensions and those extensions try to be orthogonal to each other so that you can run something like Argo and OPA at the same time and, and they don't fight with each other, right, uh, when you've got them configured well, um, you end up needing to to be able to figure out what works well together and and guide people for put this mesh set here together it's going to work well. Uh, learn how to use your monitoring stack and the self-health reporting of whatever vendor it is that you're using to tell you whether things are functioning properly or not, right? And, and at the core cube level, you see a lot of this in terms of, they call it PRR, production readiness reviews, where you're looking and saying, okay, if I'm a regular user and I wanna make, I wanna exploit feature X, how do I know that it's working? That's one of the questions you have to answer. Plain English, how do I know that it's working? Uh, but now if I am the platform owner and I'm trying to see like overall, is this feature functioning properly? 
there's a different set of, of expectations also answered in the questions. Things like, you monitor it like this. Look for this inside of your Prometheus. Set an alert on this piece. Uh, and it will let you know what to do when it goes bad, how to know that it's gone bad, um, and, and try to limit damage that way. The role of, of compatibility testing and saying, like, I know that I can upgrade this piece and then this piece and then this piece and have appropriate back pressure so that you don't upgrade and accidentally break an extension that you're using. Um, that is fairly difficult to do and it is a spot where someone like a Red Hat or, or whatever vendor it is that you're using can provide a lot of value. Uh, to helping you navigate what is is out there. You can install whatever you want, even on OpenShift. You can install anything. But we have a set that we're going to go off and be sure that it works together. We'll pick um, particular levels, make sure that they work properly, make sure that we don't install them too early uh, or that they don't depend on features that are being removed from Cube. Um, and it's that is a big job. Uh, do you run a cluster at your house? Yeah, like a, a private, no, okay. Uh, so that was one of the first things that, that I actually did. Uh, I, I installed a cluster, well, pre V1, but um, um, I installed a cluster home at home and I used it to be able to run, say the basics of our house. Uh, so the entertainment system, the backup storage, um, and, and that was a tremendous learning experience going through and sitting there like how do i actually manage it how do i do an upgrade without having an outage because uh, you know you know no one in the house wants to have an outage um and and figuring out how all of that worked was was hugely informative to being able to to build the pieces we need to do that effectively if you look at kubernetes are there any limitations where you feel that it is not a silver bullet for all situations so kubernetes by itself does have scale limitations are the most obvious ones Right. Uh, so if you if you take Kubernetes and you say, I have data centers all over the world, I want to have one Kubernetes cluster. It's just not designed to do that. That's going to be a limitation where you're always going to be looking for another tool. And, and that's reflected in basic architectural choices, right, where we made choices where uh, we're looking for a data set that will fit into a bounded set of memory. Right. We're looking at using a data store um, that has locality limitations, right? Uh, in order in order to operate efficiently. Uh, the concept of a controller, which I would actually look and say like, that's, that's probably the single most powerful concept uh, that I've seen come out of Cube. That idea of, of I am going to, to reconcile this one instance of this one thing, and I'm gonna keep doing that until I can make it work. Uh, and then I'm going to use a watch to keep myself efficient to avoid relisting all the time. Uh, conceptually, that's very easy, and it lets someone write shockingly simple code that compounds to produce really complex functionality overall. And the other side of it is that you end up with a limitation. You could only scale so far, right? Uh, the scaling issue is that you're limited by the memory you have, and you're limited by how quickly your controller can actually churn through these items. Some of that you can address with API design, but but at its core, that's gonna be the limitation that I think I see. You see some other friction points, right? So you see friction points around, um, I'm looking and trying to worry about a, a security isolation boundary on a node, and it limits how I can build my topology, right? Stuff like that. Is that fundamental? Mm, I, I bet we're going to get clever about it. I bet we're going to be able to solve that. Um, but those core uh, scaling and controller models, something that is not well suited to that, that's going to be your fundamental limitation when you get there. Do you also hear any chatter where people are like, hey, you know what, Kubernetes is too complicated, too big. Uh, what's next? You know, We should uh, look at the next technology. We should also not forget that some of these very foundational technologies like the kernel or containers or other technologies, they were also written off at some point. Hey, you know what? Yeah, we are moving to something next. But you know, those chatters, you know, they fade out, but the technologies remain. What are you hearing from Kubernetes perspective? So I will never doubt the person that comes in and says, I think I can do it simpler. 
uh, I like what you're doing. It's too complex. I can do it simpler by cutting this out. I will always pay attention to that. Uh, and, and the reason I will is, is like the world replatformed in 10 years, right? Like we came at the right moment. We had a good solution, but cube was the thing that said, well, I think I can do this simpler. I think I can do it better. Uh, and we saw the world replatform itself in 10 years to use it. And so someone who says they can, they might be right. Uh, and, and so far, I don't have a front runner in my list as a generic workload, distributed workload workhorse. Like I, I don't have one offhand that I say that's the one that's going to be, um, uh, the, the next improvement. In particular domains, you can definitely see large value adds for particular domains that are narrowing down their problem scope that lets them limit, um, limit some of the the general issues that kubernetes does handle right you you look at someone says pod disruption budget is so complicated when you combine it with node maintenance why is it so hard if i just assume my nodes never go down i can make it so much easier and and maybe for your workload in your area that can make a lot of sense um, but in general i haven't seen something that i think does a better job uh, so i think we're going to be looking at at cases where new types of workloads or some existing workloads find a way to to satisfy their niche, uh, but I haven't seen the general overall simplification yet. How important is Kubernetes for Red Hat? Kubernetes is a really big deal for Red Hat, right? We we built a product around it, OpenShift. Uh, we're building an ecosystem around that, uh, with an effort to carry us all the way from you know, run on public cloud to run a cloud-like abstraction on your private data center, right? You want to be able to scale up and scale down clusters like one of the clouds. HCP is here to help you do that on metal, right? Um, like scaling it all the way down to the edge so that you have a single way to, to be able to have your workload developers express this is what's running. Uh, and you have a single way to actually monitor all those things. Uh, it's hugely important for for Red Hat to be able to provide that because that level of consistency uh, and the ease of operation that comes with it and the assurance that um, from this ecosystem we can find the pieces that the customers need uh, to to help them all interoperate together um, is a really big bet. Where do you see Kubernetes will be in the modern world, let's say one, two, three, four, five years from now? So I see us trying to build out the next level of abstraction that we need, right? Like we have abstractions today that, that give you stateless workloads, a uh, few other kinds of workloads have been built, but I think we're gonna be building out abstractions that allow us to better separate concerns uh, of of hosts and clusters and costs and scheduling, right? Where where you want to run a thing, you know the general shape of it, but different orgs have different different constraints. Maybe some of them have a very tight budget. And so if they can find a way to have an abstraction that says, run this in the cheapest possible way uh, and be finished in the next week, um, they might take it versus someone who says, I need this to run and it needs to be finished tomorrow and it doesn't matter how much it costs. Maybe the same org does both in different areas. I think giving us a way to, to build an abstraction that allows us to optimize what we want in uh, what customers need for a given workload at a given time is going to be where we're going. Uh, so scheduling and multi-cluster equivalents of scheduling are, are really ripe areas for both expanded flexibility, where we lack the flexibility people want today, and simplification, where you can do a lot of stuff today, but it's kind of hard to get it built. And, and it's a really big space where someone could come up with a really good uh, simplification and flexibility for it that provides a lot of value. Um, I see a couple other directions as well, things like how do you how do you better take advantage of of the hardware that you have on your node? You see a lot of interest. We saw that interest back, I mean, years ago, right? You saw it with uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and it's just heated up since then for more generic kinds of hardware. I see that coming as well, uh, but I I really think that that multi-cluster abstraction is the thing that that we will produce 
in order to satisfy uh, both AI needs and existing needs. Of course, I cover a lot of open source uh, projects, technologies, companies, many hosted by the Linux Foundation. And we see a lot of work uh, where they leverage a lot of Kubernetes for themselves. At the same time, uh, Kubernetes can benefit from their work. What kind of communities around to help these additional either projects or workload there, like special interest groups are there. So talk a bit about how Kubernetes ecosystem kind of work with other open source projects of players in the space. Yeah, so so we've done we've done both proactive and reactive things, right? Uh, so when we introduce new concepts, uh, a lot of times those new concepts actually come from complaints that the ecosystem has brought to us, right? Where it's, I need to do this thing and it should be easy, but it's actually really hard. Um, and, and so we listen to those and we, we build out new features to make them work. Uh, and so you can look at something like uh, validating emission policy, right? It's, it's too hard for the entire ecosystem to build, um, to be able to build their own webhooks and to manage those webhooks on a cluster, give us a simpler way. Uh, and so you know, we go off and we build a simpler way. Um, there's also some that are coming sort of self-feeding where, where we are going to build it and then we're going to try to get people to use it, right? And so an example of that might be something like reference grants, right? We've been talking about it a long time. It's definitely a case where people inside the project identify the need. Once we build it out, we're going to have to go on a large campaign to all sorts of extensions and say, hey, we have a new way for you to do this. Uh, it's going to be more secure. It'll make your extension more applicable to a broader range of clusters that'll be able to run it because they are security sensitive. They can't run it today, but they will be able to run it tomorrow. Uh, and so, so we attempt to do both. Um, and those open SIG meetings, they're great spots for people to come and talk about both what, what's working well and what isn't. Uh, KubeCon is actually a really useful conference. Uh, for people to attend, because if you go to a session, you'll often see the people who, you know, made it, made it work, made it not work. Um, and, and it's a place where ecosystem meets, meets core on a regular basis. Can you also talk about, uh, because this year at KubeCon, we heard a lot about Gen AI. What kind of work is going on in terms of Gen AI? Now, we can look at Gen AI from two different perspectives, Gen AI for Kubernetes and Kubernetes for Gen AI workloads. Yeah, so so I am definitely looking at the perspective of how can I make Kubernetes work for Gen AI workloads, right? Uh, what about these workloads are different compared to the workloads that we've had before? What shape of thing do we need to have? And, and there's a lot of things that we can do to improve the efficiency uh, of what we can provide. Right. And a lot of that is around uh, how do we make hardware on nodes accessible in a secure way? Uh, and that secure way really is the, the trick there. Right. If you need it to be secure, you need different things than just if you need it to be available. Uh, and so that work distribution is uh, it goes all the way down to the hardware itself. How do you how do you clear the memory on your your graphics card before you slot in the next workload so you can be sure that you know coke secrets never are never even there when pepsi gets on the machine um, there's that level of question there's the level of question of of how are we going to express the like i want to test a and i want to test it against b and how do i do it there are questions around preemption and how you can choose a victim properly um, and how you can explain to a user how you make the choice. So that's where you get into those, those scheduling problems that I was talking about. Um, there is a lot of open space and a lot of activity. Uh, you'll hear DRA over and over and over and over again because that's the first step that's needed, but it's not, it's not going to be the end state, right? It'll be there in the end state, but we will have to have some additional work on top to actually be able to use it efficiently and effectively. 
Um, and some of that will be ecosystem and some of it will be core. David, thank you so much for joining me today and talk about this journey of Kubernetes and actually our own journey because we have also evolved with Kubernetes ecosystem. So thanks for those great insights. And I'd love to chat with you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had a good time.